Perfect. All thank right. you very I much. For that. No problem. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you um, today at the conference. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And wow, what a great introduction to the conference. I feel a little bit in awe of some of the speakers who've already gone before me. They've done such a fabulous job. Um, I know my talk was uh, promoted as Don't Stop Speaking Up, which is clearly something that is really important, but I feel like I covered that pretty uh, forcefully last time in, in, in September. So I would really hope that people, if they haven't seen that presentation, please go back and have a look at it. This presentation that I've developed um, today, I think is really powerful. It, we will go on a little journey and I, I hope uh, a little bit like Sarah's presentation, I hope that you can come with me on this journey with an open mind and, and let's see where we end up. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Doctor, I'm Doctor now. In September, I was a PhD candidate, but I'm actually Doctor now, which I'm very excited about to have that finished. Um, I'm a consultant, I, uh, a speaker, but I'm also a horse owner and a horse trainer. I think sometimes when people hear academics come and speak at things like this, they sometimes think that perhaps they might be people who don't have day-to-day -day experience. I was out riding my horse this afternoon. Um, so I, I, I live and breathe horses both in my work and my research and in my leisure time. So what I wanna just start off with in this presentation is a little aside, because I know that uh, when we talk about horse sport, there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a, there's a traditional justification for, in our society for using animals and in using animals for sport. And I guess I just wanted to highlight that when we talk about the use of animals being ethical, and typically we use a utilitarian approach to, to ethics, there's lots of different approaches. And, and basically in a utilitarian approach to ethics, you have a, uh, a harms versus benefits approach. But typically, I think when we, when we concentrate on the ethics of using animals in sport, we focus on the benefits to humans and perhaps uh, minimize the harms to the animals. And we know that the sport horse industry is a, is a, a multi-billion dollar industry. There's lots of people making a lot of money, um, and it, you know, there's a lot of financial rewards, people, a lot of people have jobs through the industry. And, you know, for those participating in sports, uh, there's a lot of physical and psychological benefits in terms of health and well-being. And also we can't forget that there's a lot of spectators who enjoy going and, and watching events. So those are those are benefits to humans, most certainly, but there's also lots of downsides with the animals involved. And obviously that's what this conference is all about, is um, I guess highlighting that some of those harms for horses are significant. And the thing that I guess I wanna really focus on is the fact that we do have the capacity to make change. We absolutely can uh, reduce the harms to horses and we can make their lives better whilst perhaps not actually affecting too much of the benefits that, that we enjoy as humans in participating in sport. So that's just, that's just a little aside that I wanted to talk about because I think it's something we really need to think about when we um, assume that we have an ethical right to uh, use animals <coughs> in sport. Um, exactly what are we saying we're entitled to? So let's go on to perception, because I, I didn't really introduce that first slide, but this presentation is about perception and how we can use our understanding of perception to make positive change in the horse world. So this is an old experiment. This experiment was first done in uh, the 1970s. This is a more recent, um, I guess, reversion of the um, experiment. And essentially what happened in this experiment was researchers asked 
the participants to count the number of passes that the people in white t-shirts threw to each other. And in that experiment, what they found was about 50% of the participants actually didn't see the gorilla. So why am I showing you this old experiment at a horse hyperflexion conference? Because what it shows is the things that we aren't expecting and the things that we don't attend to, we don't see. So no one who was coming in to be a participant in this experiment expected to see a gorilla. They were focused on basketballs and that's what they saw. And so with, these, um, with the results of this um, experiment, what they also found was that even people who, they used eye tracking technology, even people who looked at the gorilla, they actually looked at the gorilla, still reported they didn't see it because they weren't expecting to see it and they were focusing on something else. So when we think about hyperflexion and why some people um, can see the huge um, and really obvious signs of poor welfare that's associated with that practice, perhaps if you're a dressage judge and you're just looking at an off hind leg, you might not notice those things. Now, I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but I'm just trying to highlight that sometimes we don't all see the same thing. There's also a different kind of effect that influences what we see and what we don't see and why perhaps someone might perceive a situation differently to the way we do. And we see, we see this in science, it's called observer bias. And even in something like quantum physics, uh, if you're studying an electron and you ask a particle question, the electron will behave like a particle. If you study the electron and you're looking, you looking at or asking a energy question or a wave question, then the electron be seemingly behaves like a wave, which we don't expect that kind of thing in physics, I don't think. Um, so, and what influences those things that we attend to and what sort of questions that we ask is based on things like our assumptions, our ideology, our framework, our belief, whatever we want to call it. And when we think about our modern Western society that many of us come from, certainly that's where, where I come from, our beliefs are, are built on Plato's ideas and things like the scientific method, I'm a scientist, and traditionally those things focused on things like hierarchy, um, the fact that animals and the earth um, have been provided to us for some, if you're uh, of the Christian faith, then God provided those things. And they're, they're for our use. Uh, we also have this notion of domination. If you think about a lot of the language that we use, um, you know, it's, it's based around domination. And we think about Descartes, who was one of the first people to describe the um, scientific method that most of our science is built on. He described animals as automata. So it's like they're alive, but they don't feel, they don't think, they don't experience anything. And this was all back in the 1600s. It was you know, quite a few hundred years ago. And if we think about some of the other ideas, from those times, most of them we've discarded as we've become more sophisticated, our ability to uh, measure things has become better. We've realized that many of those ideas are really outdated and they're not, they don't, they're not accurate. Um, yet this idea that animals don't feel, don't think, don't experience emotions, we seem to have hung on, hung to this idea. Um, and it's interesting. And then we contrast that to really ancient cultures. And then we perhaps more modern cultures as well. We, the pendulum swings from one side to the other. We, you have cultures that are built around equality and ideas of protecting animals in the earth because, you know, without the animals and, and earth, we as humans don't do so well. You know, I know some of the, uh, 
tech billionaires think maybe we could go and live on Mars, but I don't really want to live on Mars. I, I like it. <laughs> and there's certainly no horses on Mars. Um, and then we have these ideas of partnership and, and that animals are sentient. So where people sit on this, you know, these two ends of the spectrum, like clearly these are extremes and we probably, all of us sit somewhere in the middle uh, on this spectrum. But these ideas are often really invisible, um, but they're powerful. They influence, the, they create the lens through which we see the world. So when we come to an image like this, our assumptions about the world and the things that we attend to will determine what we see. So there'll be some people clearly for whom ethically it's okay and uh, according to their, their lens, they don't see a problem with this. For other people, they see lots of problems. But we can see what I hope we, my presentation is starting to do is to help us see why, understand why some people might see things one way versus another. Your perception, however, doesn't negate the fact that science has shown that horses in, these post in this posture will be experiencing breathlessness, most likely they're experiencing pain, and they're probably feeling quite helpless. Because I think too, it's worth remembering that as I presented in September, this posture is used mostly to dominate the, the horse, right? Hyperflexion is, is a tool to dominate the horse and subjugate the horse so that, you know, you can get the performance. It's, it's not a, it doesn't do anything for the horse's uh, gym, gymnastic ability. It's about control and domination. So regardless of what your perception is, you can't, um, well, it's getting harder to deny the fact that uh, this posture is associated with very poor welfare for the horse. So a little bit of good news. <laughs> that, seemed, that seemed very doom and gloom. Some good news. I did some research that was published at the start of this year, and it was on amateur equestrians. It wasn't elite equestrians. It was amateur equestrians. And what I found was that most of them really did strive, like they cared about the welfare of their horse. They, you know, they wanted things to be good with their horse. What I also found was that their practice didn't align with their ideal. So even though they wanted good welfare for their horse, if there was a tension between what was good for them versus what was good for the horse, mostly they chose what was good for them. Um, which probably isn't too unexpected. But in saying that, I think the gap is an opportunity. I think the fact that people do care and they do want things to be better, I think that provides us with an opportunity. And, uh, and I wanted to put on the, um, the image of this meme about the more I think, the more confused I get, because that's totally how I felt. And I think that's probably... Um, how many amateur equestrians uh, are feeling, especially as we have more social media coming out with uh, the alternative view, I guess, to the to the FEI narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I think people probably are scratching their heads, thinking, "Gosh, there's one group of people saying that the this you know hyperflexion and what what's happening in elite uh, dressage is not good for horses, but." I've got a coach and she's telling me I need to do this and I'm sure they are confused and certainly I was confused and I don't profess to say I have all of the answers but I feel like since doing a PhD where I've really specialised in, in ridden horse welfare and, um, and rider motivation that I have a few more of the questions and I think asking the right questions is a really uh, good way to go in terms of helping us find the answers. So um, I really, <laughs> I can empathise 
as a as a horse owner and a rider, I can empathise with people who are genuinely feeling confused and where perhaps being reminded that their ideals and their practice doesn't align could be a little confronting. So how do we get from ideal to practice? Because literally that is the $64,000 question. How do we get from what people want for their horses to, to practice where horses are doing really well and, and, and it's a positive experience to participate in sport? So what, we, what we've all seen um, already so far today in the conference is we know we have 5,000 years of tradition and this is, kind of, this is where we've ended up. We've ended up with horses being ridden in hyperflexion and people using belly bands to cover up their spur marks, which is, you know, they're two really clear, um, you know, indicators of poor training, you know, and, and poor, um, a, a poor relationship with the horse. If you need to, if you need to use this approach, then things aren't going well. But if you were to listen to a coach um, or, or, or an elite rider speak, they're very certain, you know, they're certain that things that this is how things should be, that this represents the pinnacle of the sport. Um, there's a high degree of certainty, even in the language, you know, used by the FBI, you know, there's a high degree of certainty. The problem with certainty though, is that it makes us rigid. It makes us inflexible. We don't think about trying things in a different way. And the other thing about being certain is it makes us really defensive. So if someone challenges an idea, we instantly put out, get our backs up and, and we get very defensive. Recently, I read a great book called Uncertainty, The Wisdom and Wonder of Being Unsure. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And maybe uncertainty might just save our sport and like I mentioned at the start, you know, I, I'm hoping you you can come with me on this journey, and 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 consider um, being a little uncertain. And so Maggie Jackson, the author of this book, makes a statement: it's not outrageous, and increasingly it's necessary to ponder a future in which our uncertainty can save humanity. Now she's talking about she's not talking about equestrian sport. But I can see how this kind of uncertainty might save our sport if we can nurture it and we can grow it and uh, join up with, get people to join together. I think we have an opportunity to create some change because when we're uncertain, we start to ask questions. We want to know, uh, what can I do differently? I'm not sure about this. So we learn, we investigate, and we start to become creative. And I know since I first started writing where I was a very traditional um, amateur competitive writer, and I did things just like everybody else does, or, you know, many people do still, but I do things very differently now. And that was a journey and at times it was a really uncomfortable journey. But I look at the benefits that I enjoy now with my horses and I wouldn't change anything. So, which sounds very certain, doesn't it? <laughs> which is a bit contradictory. But I, I'm still playing around and I'm still exploring and seeing how I can do things differently. And I think uncertainty really is an opportunity for us. So if we, we think about the fact that people want to improve welfare, if we can try and create a bit of space and make people, um, or not make people, but encourage people to be curious and uncertain about things or less sure about things, then I think we have a great opportunity. Because we really could ask ourselves where are each of us on the certainty spectrum and I it came across my social media feed recently. It was this fellow, Brendan Wise. I don't know him. 
Um, but I watched him do a Grand Prix show jumping round. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't perfect. But he did it without a bridle. And his horse seemed to go pretty well. And so he is someone who is clearly curious. And perhaps he's a bit uncertain too uh, in terms of how he's training. When you're certain, we've got this photo on the left. Um, this is where certainty has led us. Um, and, and I feel like it's a, it's not going to get us to a happy ending with horse sport. I think it's, it just isn't. People, society's changing. We talked about ethics and assumptions. I think all of those things are changing. So I think if we can nurture this curiosity, then I think that's a great opportunity. And, and I think encouraging ourselves to be a bit more reflective and think a bit more about what is driving us, what, what, um, what, what am, why am I doing this and is this the best way? Asking ourselves questions I think is really helpful. So this brings us to conversation. There is a branch of psychology where they have demonstrated that having one conversation uh, with, with another person who is genuinely interested in you, um, is not judging you, um, can lead to lasting transformational change. So if we, if we do our own homework, by homework for me, if we think about well, what are my assumptions, where, where am I coming from when I, when I go to have a conversation with someone else, what am I assuming, how certain am I, where am I on this certainty spectrum and how curious am I, um, not only curious about myself and what I'm doing but also curious about what other people are doing, if we can do that in a way that is um, genuine and uh, genuine and curious, then I think we can have start to have some really fruitful conversations. And do I think that this is going to work with the FEI, given what Eva told us at the start? Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not, because it doesn't sound like they have yet. They're still very certain. Uh, it, it appears. I don't know. I don't haven't spoken to anyone there. But it appears they're still very certain. They're, they're in that really rigid, offensive um, sort of frame of mind. But I think there's this conference is proof that there are lots of people who aren't so rigid, who aren't so certain, and who are seeking um, difference and change. And so I think that that is a great opportunity that if we can get together, <laughs> start these conversations, have more of them, that we can start to build this transformation and change. So I think really the, you know, and this is nothing that probably everyone in the, in the audience um, is not aware of, but I think it's still worth pointing out. It's the fact that these old rigid traditional approaches are probably going to drive equestrian <coughs> sport into history. However, if we can be curious and less certain and, and seeking change and, and willing to talk about it and explore opportunities for making things better for horses, then I think we have a great shot at making equestrian sport something that does go on into the future. And I just wanted to highlight too that we live in a time where there's some really dreadful things going on in the world. Um, and it can, it's easy to feel a bit helpless and hopeless. Um, and I totally understand it if people feel like they can't change the world. I know I certainly can't change the world. But we can change where we are. And we can do that in small steps and, and find, find, find the others, find the other people who think like you and, and talk and share. And, and I, think, I think we have a real momentum going at the moment and I hope that that continues. So if you've enjoyed my talk, my presentation uh, today, uh, I've joined up with one of my great friends, Mita Osborne, and we're actually starting a podcast. It'll be 
launching probably at the end of May, early June. We've been working incredibly hard on it. We have some great guests who we will be having these sorts of conversations with. Uh, I hope you'll tune in. It's um, been an enormous amount of fun um, talking to these people and, and just exploring what, you know, where can we go? Where can we take this? How can we make things better? And I also run workshops for individuals and for organisations where we go, we explore these ideas in depth and, and work on creating change. So thank you so much for your time. Here's all the references that I've used. Um, and I'm happy to take uh, questions if we have time, but if not, hopefully I'll stay up for the uh, round table. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the questions will be for the roundtable because now um, we have to go on with the program. Thank you.